<laughs> All right, y'all. Um, my name is Kelsey Dillo. I'm the gallery manager here at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Welcome to our first ever instructor roundtable discussion. Um, so our goal here is to highlight the talented artists that were scheduled to teach at Aramont this year. We want to discuss ideas in contemporary craft, and we want to strengthen the connections within our community at a time when we need it more than ever. So check out the 2020 instructor exhibition on our website for more information on all of our instructors and their work. Um, I want to remind all of y'all watching that you'll be muted during our chat today, but we encourage you to post questions that you might have in the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen. We're going to do our best to get to as many of those as we can towards the end of our chat today. More information about all of our panelists here is going to be shared in the chat bar on the side of your screen. And our discussion is being recorded um, and posted to our website and YouTube channel later this week, so you can go back and watch. Um, so, without further ado, today we're talking to four artists whose work relates to the theme of identity. Our panel today includes Tanya Crane, jeweler, object maker, and educator in Boston. Salvador Jimenez Flores, interdisciplinary artist and educator based in Chicago. Leslie Pearson, multimedia artist in Fayetteville, North Carolina and Heinrich Toe, printmaker and educator in Kansas City. So thank all of y'all for being the first artist to participate in these discussions with us. We're so happy to have you with us. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, I wanna get their thoughts on their on identity and craft. Um, so Tanya, would you wanna start us out with an introduction, the workshop that you were scheduled to teach here at Aramont and talk about your work as it relates to identity. Okay. Um, hello everyone out there in virtual world. Um, my name is Tanya Crane and I currently live in Medford, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, I'm originally from Southern California, but have lived everywhere but the South. Um, oh. oh, nice. <laughs> uh, so, the, the workshop that I was going to teach uh, was about surfaces and enamel, um, is, which is really what I'm focusing right now in on my work are um, the various tech, or the various materials that interact with enamel, um, such as sand and steel, um, and how these things have a long history, and how I can connect those to the history of craft, how I can connect those to the history of art jewelry um and art so it's about my workshop that i was going to teach <laughs> and next summer hopefully we'll be, be teaching in a, in a brief version of that um i currently work at the museum school in um in boston which is now a part of tufts university and um we are a school that does not have majors. We are an interdisciplinary program where we give a studio art degree. And um, so our, we have a very like, well-rounded graduating class every year that so kept their toes in um, you know, media, performance, um, installation art, uh, things like that. We have some you know, very famous graduates or uh, alums from the SMFA um, People, some that, that went sh for a short period of time, some that went for full, uh, four years, but um, that's mfa at tufts .org, um, or dot edu, excuse me, and um, I think that's it. Do you want to talk a little bit about your work as it relates to our theme today? Uh, sure. So, um, for the past, I would say, almost 10 years, I've been creating work that, um, in like small bodies of work that deal with identity specifically um, my identity as um, a half black half white um, American woman and um, I I relate to where I live so <clears throat> identity as defined by my community um, my current community so having grown up in Southern California um, I lived between a very white suburb and then um, South Central Los Angeles, where my father's side of the family lived. And um, my connection to those worlds were like very separate. Um, but obviously I'm an amalgamation of both. So 
also, when I started uh, started moving across the United States, I started reflecting on um, this, uh, I don't know, like, reflecting on like instances, reflecting on um, how I'm perceived within my new communities and started making some work that responded to that. So um, in Seattle, this is where I really kind of learned metalsmithing. So that was just kind of like a kind of a technical journey. Then moved to New York where I got um, a, an undergraduate degree in metals. And um, one of my teachers, Jamie Bennett is uh, an amazing enamelist. So uh, I learned some really um, dynamic enamel techniques from him, um, which I utilize today. And then um, the Midwest, which was a really strange landscape. Um, <laughs> it was my grad school at UW Madison. Um, I learned from Lisa Gralnick and Jeffrey Clancy and um, Tina Rath and Lindsay Rice. Uh, and had a very kind of eclectic education there, but also was reacting to the, just the really weird um, place that I was put in as a black woman and having like just a whole sea of white around me. Um, and also like corn. <laughs> um, and then, you know, back on the East Coast, this is where this is where the uh, American Industrial Revolution uh, started in Pawtucket, uh, which is just south of here in Rhode Island. And I'm responding to um, just the kind of detritus that's left behind the like erasure of black culture um, with like this dominant white focus. And I'm responding to that now in my work that is actually a little bit more colorful. Um, I'm kind of moving away from the black and white and moving into color as a response to that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Salvador, would you like to go next? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, hello, my name is uh, Salvador Jimenez Flores, and um, I was born and raised in Mexico, and I came to the States in 2000. And I think, you know, it was through, through art that I kind of like found a way of communicating everything that I was going through um, at that time. And, and also, it kind of like just allowed me to create uh, this visual language or a way of expressing like what was going on uh, with me during that time. So I have a, you know, a background in graphic design and, and from there I went into pre-making, drawing, um, and then I did uh, community-based art where I did a lot of murals in, in Chicago and community-based projects. And then uh, I moved them to Boston for, for a residency at the Harvest Ceramics program and and did some ceramics there as well as some uh, community-based programs there. And um, um, I'm also an educator. And I, I teach at the School of the Art Institute and, and uh, I teach in the ceramic department. And um, I think ceramics, the way I got into it was um, almost as a, I guess I was, I was uh, scheduled to get a master's in drawing, but I took this elective in ceramics uh, with uh, Israel Davis, who then uh, kind of like introduced me to this world of craft and, and I just kept taking it. And I think the more I investigated about the craft, the more um, it related, this material related more with the themes that I was trying to address. And um, I think my work, it is, you know, a lot of it is about identity, it's about, the the experience of having this double consciousness of you know being a, a national mexican living in the united states but also dealing with this uh, history of these two countries that have been kind of like fighting and being really good friends and neighbors at different times and and uh and also part of part of it is also like my history the history of my family with with this country, like my great grandfather was part of the um, building the railroads in the Midwest. And then my dad worked uh, as part of the Bracero program. And, and then through, because of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that's actually what made us migrate back to, to Chicago to, to get more opportunities. So that just kind of gives you an idea on how, you know, we create these borders, these lines, and and, you know, we're just like animals, you know, we're just 
meant to migrate and, and look for for a better life wherever we can find it. Um, so I'm I'm back in Chicago and and it feels good to to be back and also kind of like acknowledge this history of of my family in the Midwest, which I didn't know until recently. And um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about my work, um, a very condensed version. And I guess uh, for Armand, I was scheduled to teach with my partner, uh, Casey Walden. And the class title was uh, Rasquache and Southern Kitsch, I think. Um, so, you know, we're kind of like thinking about identity and, and, and all this narrative that gets created uh, through sculpture. Uh, a lot of her work uh, deals with, um, with nature and, 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 and the, the Southern culture. And mine, I was tapping into this idea of rasquache, kind of like making do with what's available. So we were really excited uh, to teach this class and collaborate with with the the, the community in Aramont, which it was gonna be my my first time there for me and uh, for her as well. So maybe next year, <laughs> but uh, we were really excited about the uh, the opportunity to mix uh, ceramics with uh, fun objects. And also like this intensive of one week workshops, which, you know, we were excited about that challenge too. Yeah. Thank you, Salvador. <laughs> Leslie, you want to go next? Oh, I think you're muted. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> um, my name is Leslie Pearson and I'm an artist uh, working in Fayetteville, North Carolina, home to the uh, Fort Bragg military installation. Uh, my husband and I are both former military, and um, we found that we have just decided to make our home here. Um, I own a pie shop, uh, savory and sweet pies we make. Um, so, you know, I split my time between making art, making pies, <laughs> and and other things. But really, my my work is about memory and identity formation and the transformative value of communication. And I started really processing those ideas when in about 2009 when my grandma was dying it was happening simultaneously to when i was trying to really come up with some you know authentic an authentic place within my work for my my graduate work at east carolina university so i was seeking within myself and she this was happening where i felt like oh you know i may be losing this connection that I have with my past. And so, you know, I was just, you know, getting all information I could from her about people, people who have passed on connections within the family, these types of things. And I started accumulating these ideas and these stories. And I realized that this is truly so important because I had a lot of, you know, um, questions about things that were coming out um you know who i am who am i because i grew up in a, a really rural town in missouri who am i because i was raised in a certain faith who am i because of our economic uh situation our financial situation all of these factors kind of played into who I became as an adult person. I was also the first person to go to college. Um, my family, they were very poor, uneducated, you know, things like this. And so I felt during times of growing up that I was sort of trying to quote unquote better myself, trying to get out of that situation and would often distance myself from certain things that I grew up around all the time, gardening, anything that I associated with sort of country life, something that a poor person might do. For some reason, I had that in my, that thought in my mind. And um, so that was actually the basis of my thesis work was, um, it was called Vignettes of a Family. And I was really making it very personal and collecting letters, anything that I could the things that were written and I started incorporating text into my work, these 
journals. My dad had died of cancer. He had written out journal, journal entries. I incorporated these into my works. And as far as narrative therapy goes, I was literally writing my mom, writing my family members with questions and asking them certain things that they would write me back when they had time to really process their thoughts and everything. And I incorporated some of those things into the work as well. So that's kind of where that all stemmed from. And I also, ironically, during that time, I discovered hog intestine as an art material. So I started creating these delicate forms and out of uh, wire and then using the membrane to cover those. And then I found that I could, take fabric, um, either put journal entries on those, write on those, print out photos, things like that, and sandwich those in between the layers of gut. So I felt for me, it was like the connection to this was really visceral, um, literally and figuratively. So I started working with gut, which is one of the things that, which is what I was going to teach at Aramont. So I was going to teach the basics of the wire sculpture and gut and then have the students bring in personal ephemera and create something personal that not only would be a beautiful object but would tell a story tell a story that perhaps could be therapeutic to them as well so um but now what's kind of ironic is now i'm 44 and here i am trying to do gardening canning I'm really getting back to my roots and it's helping me even more inform my work, the work that I'm going to be working on as soon as COVID's done, I guess. But that's me. Thanks, Leslie. Heinrich? Hi. Thanks for having me on here and all of you for joining us. Um, so I'm an artist that works in the medium um, of printmaking. I graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Art um, and the LaSalle College of the Arts in Singapore, where I'm from. Um, so I guess I've been in the States the last 23 years, I think. So it is a, uh, often a, a dialogue that I have um, with my work about that sense of uh, assimilation. So the work explores the idea of home, displacement, and eventually a stimulation um, in relation to the evolution of identity over a period of time. Um, I often tap into cultural elements that appear in my past, whether they may be specific objects or pattern. Pattern plays a important um, element in my work, uh, specifically looking at, so brocades or kabayas that my grandmother used to wear. Um, and for me, it's a means of exploring and identifying and retaining that very sense of my um, Pranakan heritage. Uh, the longer you live somewhere, the more you forget your past. And um, a catchphrase that I feel at a moment is extremely loaded for me that I get asked a lot is, where are you from? And um, that's driven me to seek an answer that is difficult to explain if you don't know where you're from. So, um, in a nutshell, the work has evolved over a period of time based on me visiting a lot of past um, objects and places and how that evolved over time and what that definition of home actually means to me. Um, the imagery that I include as well includes a lot of American landscapes, specifically national parks that I visit. Um, and that defines what home is for me growing up, you know, in a big city of skyscrapers and, and that definition of what 
the national park means to uh, me and to everyone where it's actually a place that belongs to her, but it may seem not true nowadays. And you know, there are a lot of undertones that, that define in my eyes where I'm from, uh, whether it's where you live or, or where you come from. Um, a lot of florals, again, um, that kind of float in and out of my work kind of explore that sense of where um, that sense of pattern and, and geometric shapes that floats define both where I'm going uh, in the present and, and heading towards the future as well. The workshop that I was supposed to teach and will be doing next year is called High Rolling monoprints and it is a, a workshop for image makers you know like myself who basically explore imagery you know specifically whether they're found or they are um, images of your own that you can literally um, transfer using a, a paper lithography transfer process uh, mm -hmm. where Literally all my work is, is one-offs, uh, they're all monoprints. I don't do any additions. So, you know, uh, whether you're a photographer or a, um, um, a painter, designer, it's, it's, it's a fun little workshop that you can actually incorporate a variety of different um, processes to get imagery onto paper. So that's, right. that's what it is. Awesome. Well, I'm going to open up the floor um, to y'all. My first question that I'd love to get started with um, is to just talk with y'all about how the mediums that you choose in your work um, play specifically into these ideas involving identity. So like, you know, whether you're a printmaker or you're a ceramicist, like how do those mediums specifically help you navigate the concepts of identity that you work with. Anyone can jump in. Well, this is Leslie. For me, <clears throat> when I'm working with the wire and gut, the wire is this strong skeletal element, kind of like our bones, you know, so I'm thinking on a, on a personal level. And then when you put the membrane on, it's very fragile and you stretch it over and it dries and it's this almost like parchment paper. And over the course of time, the, the wire rusts and causes things to happen and change with the hog intestine. And so just like people, just like we do, just like I do, it changes its nature changes like our identity changes and so i find that i don't know it just i have a connection with it and also just the fact that i can add other elements into it and it still has a, a light but also kind of an older feeling to it for me i think that um enamel itself doesn't have connection to identity for me but I think that um, the images that I create with the enamel do speak to cultures and a lot of people identify themselves specifically with a culture um, but cultures evolve and change so my work is evolving and changing and <clears throat> I was thinking about like what Heinrich just just said about assimilation it's like, I don't want to get stuck in a rut of material that makes me stagnant. So I'm always looking to kind of add something to it um, to create a new language or a new image um, that could like act as an identifier of a moment because it's evolving. I'll jump in. Um... I mean, I think I spoke a little bit um, earlier about it, but I think for me, I, I really found this connection with clay, especially because it's, you know, it's, it's such a humble material that you can find pretty much almost anywhere in the world. And, and it has been part of 
every civilization. And, um, and I think I gravitated to that material once I started working with it. And it was like something happened with that, that, you know, it might sound a little romantic or, or maybe I'm romanticizing that, but it, it, it felt like I had this um, transgenerational connection with, with some sort of ancestors, you know, just by touching this material. And then after that, you know, doing some research on, on, on pre-Columbian aesthetics and work and, and, and how they, they told their story, uh, this beautiful artwork that they created and, and how they created um, their culture and rituals around these objects. I was interested in, in that and then combining that with um, the present and how that connects with my, um, my situation here living in the States and, and in, in the United States and, and this whole idea of identity, right? Like uh, as Henrich was saying, this idea of assimilation, which happens to a lot of us who migrate to the States, uh, it seems like that's the goal, like to be as white as you can be so you can assimilate and get by. And then after living here for 20 something years, you realize like, no, I don't want to lose who I am. You know, part of it is of who I am is like being part of this culture and, and enriching myself from that and also giving back to this, to this uh, society by, by understanding this mixture of things. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we're so caught up in this idea of colorism and, and labels and, and thinking of, of someone who is an American uh, having an, a certain aesthetic, which, you know, it's for, at so many levels, it doesn't make sense. And uh, so I got to a point where I just feel really comfortable with who I, who I am and embracing my brown skin. And it's like, this is, this is who I am. And if you really think about the concept of America, like with my people, I have been here longer than, you know, most of the second wave of immigrants from Europe. So I think this idea of labeling and calling uh, oneself American. I mean, if anything, you know, I've always been an American because I was born in this hemisphere. And, you know, and even like in, in Mexico, there was already like all this mixing of cultures, uh, you know, with European, African uh, people and, and also uh, indigenous people. Sorry about the, the beautiful soundtrack. Uh, yeah, that was kind of cool. <laughs> Salvador is like, um, I, uh, oh. it in, um, all right, I'll, I think I'll probably just leave it there. <laughs> I did a month long residency in Lake Chapala in um, Ahihik right out of grad school, and the only material I could get my hands on there. Um, was clay and um, and it was given to me by a local man who um, he it was passed down through his family as like a, a way of making um, a living making these really beautiful clay whistles and he literally went behind his house and dug up the clay there and processed it and um, was the only generous soul who would offer me a material to work with while I was there for a month because the, the expats that lived in that town, they didn't want you to take any business from them. So they wouldn't reveal any of their sources for material. So I was literally like in you know, a place where I had access to nothing, but the, you know, the person who lived there um, was the only generous person. Um, I think I, I feel fortunate that printmaking, you know, being a, a medium that a lot of us look at as basically one that presents itself as a, you know, a image producing medium. Um, to me, I, I think that I, I look at, at the use of media more as what you make of it. Um, you know, I, I, there is obviously history tied into to printmaking with, with certain, you know, cultural groups, but a lot of it is what we make of it. Um, I think it goes back as well where how I use a medium 
and reflect on, on what uh, my own narrative is over time and how I'm using that. And, and again, that does change. Um, a good question again that I'm thinking about is, is um, whether or not, you know, it ties in a little to, to that question that, that Maurice had asked um, in the Q&A. And I'm, I'm really reflecting on that because why am I doing in my narrative, um, putting my own imagery in there and what am I trying to say and who am I making it for? You know, it's a question I ask myself pretty often. And um, whether it's my responsibility, if my work is indeed about identity and in my own culture, is it, is it my role as an artist to um, educate a viewer coming in, for example, or someone off the street were to ask me, you know, um, where you're from, who are you, what do you do? And I think a lot of them tie into that um, in terms of, of medium, as a choice where how you portray it and, and that differs space on I think um, instances that I've experienced myself that you know leads itself to a whole different conversation but um, I think we are fortunate as creators to be able to to use that to our advantage and, and especially at the time we are at right now so yeah. And I think with your work in printmaking and the layers and layers that you add, you know, there's so many layers of, of your identity and of you as a person. And, you know, I can, I could see where that connection is to the process of printmaking. For sure. For sure. Yeah. There's a lot of layers that go into that, but at the same time, last I agree with what you said, where, um, immediately not everyone does see that mm -hmm. and i'm okay with that right you know i i do take the responsibility to say hey it's okay if you don't see that immediately you know i mean i don't want to relay all my answers you know on a plate per se so i always think that there's two ways of looking at artwork people who let's just say come into a gallery they can see something and they can say it's a beautiful object or it's a beautiful painting or it's a beautiful piece of work and really enjoy it for those aesthetic qualities. But then when you, there's something that's rich that when, when they maybe read the artist statement or investigate more about the artist or get a chance to like hear us speak about our work or, you know, talk to the artist at an opening or something. And then we can share that. And it, and it even adds more of a rich, richness to the work, being able to communicate that. But, you know, we still make work that you want to grab a viewer's eye. You want to draw them into it for, for just its basic aesthetic qualities. Sure. Well, I have another question for you all if you're up for it. Um, thinking about your roles as educators, um, how has teaching at Aramont or workshops or in academia impacted your own personal studio practice? Tremendously. <laughs> 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 I think that uh, um, I think that taking a class and teaching at a craft school should be compulsory. Um, it's it's a it's another viewpoint that. Um, that just learning in, in an art institution is not going to give you. You know, it's more of a real life experience than um, this kind of, uh, you know, sewn up, very small world view that an art school might offer um, traditionally. And hoping that we are all breaking those, those boundaries right now. But um, I've, I, craft schools have changed my life. And I'm very thankful that, you know, I was introduced in, in my undergraduate studies to craft schools, but I also um, feel really, really strongly that it should be like a component of an education. So I feel like there's a, an accessibility um, for most people to be able to take classes at a craft school. Um, you know, there's tons of scholarships, they're heavily funded. Um, they're in every community. You just gotta kind of look for them. They're really, there are a lot of them out there. Um, 
but yeah, I just, I can't say enough about it. I mean, yeah. I'll show you. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Well, I think it's, uh, for me, it's just the synergy that I was able to experience at Aramont was really thrilling for me. And, you know, anytime you get outside of your own studio where you're working, you know, solo for so long, you get kind of myopic about your work, you get stuck on certain things, you can't see beyond your own nose. And just being with other people with different perspectives, different backgrounds, different level of skill, that that really does inform my work. They might be able to see something or say something that I just didn't understand, didn't see, uh, something that might be obvious to them that I've been trying to express. And just getting that freshness, that newness. And also, I think craft schools are not as pretentious sometimes as the art, in, art institutes are. You know, um, you, get, uh, you get people from all walks of life who can come in and take a class. And I, and I enjoy that. Yeah. Anybody else? I I think that we do need to work on the, the diversity issue. I think, you know, what the current uh, state of things is really pushing everybody to, to really reflect on what's happening and what their student body looks like. So, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the way, the way I look at my practice, it's, um, it's this idea of, you know, the educator, the artist, and, and the citizen. And whenever I'm asking in any of those, I try to find where they overlap. Um, for instance, uh, I'm interested in, in the idea, as an artist, I feel like I have this responsibility to create work that addresses those issues that affect my community. And, and also hoping that other people can relate to that work and maybe that can lead to reflection or some actions through, through that work. Um, and as an educator, I feel like I want to make sure that my students get the, the knowledge that they need, uh, you know, not just like understanding the craft, but also understanding how to be like, um, like good citizens, you know, and, and just being, um, yeah, like this idea of shared knowledge, and especially I think with craft, you know, we all learn this from someone. And then we kind of like took it our own way and we're twisting it, adding in our own twist. And then we're sharing our knowledge with older students and then they're doing the same. And I think that's, that's a beautiful thing that happens in teaching is where you share something uh, to your students and then they just take it and mold it their own way. And then they get to teach it to someone else. And I think um, also with the idea of, of education and knowledge is like, this idea of, of knowledge is everywhere, you know, and we can share it and find it in, in our schools or in craft schools, but also in the community. And also it takes just about a matter of talking to your neighbor and learning something from them and, and how can you share small things, you know, this shared knowledge that can be passed down. And as a citizen, I mean, I just feel like um, we have the responsibility, like if we don't like what we see right now, we can change that, you know, and it starts by working in ourselves internally and then uh, working with the people around us and changing those things that, that, that will create a better world for us. So I'm always thinking about how all these three components, the artist, the educator, and the citizen intersect. And I always try to tap into those things. Um, the, the issue, I think the main issue right now it's as accessibility, you know, with, with art and craft. And, and how can you reach out more people? Or how, and now, I guess now that we're working remotely and try to come up with just ways of making that are more like in the do-it-yourself movement type of thing, I think it's also creating a, a different perspective. Like, if you really want to make art, you find a way to make it, you know. Uh, maybe... You might not be using state-of-the-art equipment, but you can tap into other ways of, of making and expressing your, your idea. Um, so um, I'm ex 
you know, I'm interested in, in what's going to happen this fall with a lot of schools going, going back to school and try to figure out whether it's going to be a hybrid model or online and the type of work that comes out of this. Because I think we're going to learn a lot about us as creative people. And um, it, will be, it will be interesting. And I guess the last thing that I would say is like, for me, like to, in order to be a good in, instructor or educator, I feel like I have to be on top of my game as an artist and vice versa, you know, to be a good artist, uh, you know, I have to educate myself and and I constantly learn from my students or, you know, or another thing, another layer is like when we're in the classroom, my, I always tell my students, we're all artists before we do anything, you know, we're all uh, artists. I'm just a facilitator for, for this medium. And I learn a lot from my students and, you know, and, and I hope that they get something out of these classes. And, and it is that synergy that happens in the classroom that, that, that is the magic, right? Like we're learning from one another. Well, I've got a couple of questions from folks in the audience. Um, so the first one that I'm going to throw out there for y'all as art educators, what advice or techniques do you have for artists or students exploring their personal identity in their own art process and creative exploration? Do you have any favorite projects that you assign or personal exercises that you do that explore those themes? Well, for me, um, I journal daily. I write down a lot of things. That's and and that gets the um, gets the brain going and that's a really easy personal exercise that anyone can do at any moment and you really learn a lot about yourself um, you can write questions down that you want to seek out answers to and we get so busy throughout the day you know if you can grab a couple minutes in the morning and just write that down you can look back over the years of these journals and see how far you've come see what see what you were thinking over the years see who you have become mm -hmm. so that's what i that's what i do and i always encourage any students to do that if you're on a walk or out in the community what what are you gravitating towards like what catches your eye um what are you responding to like I would say these are the things that you should kind of catalog and really kind of push away from how other people are responding to you. So in thinking about your kind of internalization of your identity, it's, it's inside. And so you need to get that out. So, I mean, these are kind of like some, some ways of figuring out how to express that. I want to add on that, actually, Tanya. I think the, the very definition of, of, of viewing identity is very broad, you know, and, and um, definition of what that means changes by the day. So I think a lot of that, especially as, as um, you know, all of us being in terms of keyword there, writing, cataloging, knowing, and questioning, I think, Questioning yourself, what are the elements that define who you are? Uh, for me, that's how I start um, knowing what they are, writing them down, and then exploring and researching, expanding on what that little differences and the elements in there are about. And that for me opens more doors towards exploring things that, that I may have not thought about. Uh, from that point on, then perhaps your choice of medium comes into play. Um, whether you're more inclined to it, something that's more two-dimensional or three-dimensional, um, and that will open more doors again to different processes that are out there because you know it's it's limitless on access on what we have there. You know, as as an instructor, uh, as a student myself, because you know, for me, I believe that I don't ever want to stop learning. There's something that I see out there that I'm not familiar with, and that's going to help me achieve my goal 
I will go and seek that and be a student and, and keep learning the process, to find you know the best means and goals of achieving that and coming back in as being an instructor. My role again is being a conduit of you achieving your goals in a multitude of ways that um, that can help you achieve that. That's what I want to say. So yeah. I mean, I think for me, I mean, what I think for everyone, especially the students, is finding what they're passionate about. You know whatever that might be, whether that's uh, dealing, whatever it's dealing with themes of identity or culture or anything, but it could also be color, it could be patterns, but think about whatever they're passionate about and then, you know, keep uh, researching about those things. Because I think the the work that I'm interested in creating and, and that I'm passionate about when I see it is when when people um, make work about what they know, you know, and, and I think that's that's the best way to make authentic art. It's just like it's stick to those things that you know and that you're interested in, and you're passionate about. Because I think that's that's an easier way for the work just to kind of like come naturally in a way, you know. And find ways to experience things too. I feel like, you know, beyond researching things, I, I feel like you really need to have experience, like tactile experiences with your environment. So, you know, I don't know, beyond, beyond the, uh, you know, taking a class in, you know, paper making or clay, like, you know, experience the world that's outside of the classroom walls, come back in and you're going to have way more to put into that work. Absolutely, yeah. I've got another question for craft schools, <laughs> right? So you're going to another place, and it's a new environment that has a lot around it. So, I mean, Aramont, gateway to the Smoky Mountains. Hello. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I smell a flower, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got another viewer question for you. Um, so. When you talk about your work focusing on identity, does that mean that you feel an imperative to question and confront stereotypes? Or is that more of a question or effort to depict your own specific identity attributes in a clearer and more informative manner? All of the above. <laughs> I think it's going on. I mean, I, I think, I guess I'll, I'll try to tap into that a little bit. I think the idea of identity sometimes the work that we make is not really necessarily about identity. It's just kind of like about our own experiences, like Tanya said. But I think people, unfortunately, sometimes they're so narrow-minded that they just see that we're people of color, artists of color, and then uh, they just assume that it's about identity. And they, that kind of like makes them see the work in a very narrow format, when really the work is a lot more um, broad, you know? So I think part of it is is, is the viewers. Uh, sometimes they they limit themselves to what they can see in the work. Absolutely, and that's about experience. It's like that's about people having limited experiences. So that's why you know me being in like a Midwest setting, I was on view all the time. People were trying to figure me out <laughs> all the time. Um, and that's on them. So, you know, they can go beyond looking at me and, and trying to figure out what, you know, black means. They can, they can have other experiences that maybe define black. And that's on them. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, how do you dig deeper into your work uh, or into a sense of identity in your work? How do you move past surface or superficial markers of identity yeah I guess I'll <laughs> that's a tough one yeah i mean I, I think i can speak to the the one about going deeper i think i'm always interested in in going deeper into my identity work or just my identity as in general because i think for me i'm interested in the journey of understanding what does it be what does it mean to be human right and i think art is a good 
conduit and vehicle to to understand that. So I'm interested in that uh, inter being intro inter, in, intro intro like just digging deeper, I guess, into myself and yeah, intro yeah. Thank you. That. And uh, I'm interested in in that. Uh, I think that's the that's the beauty of it. Like it's never ending. You know, you can die and never understand what you were meant to be here. You know. <laughs> yeah. I I think that you know that's a good question that that we all reflect on and and will reflect on over a longer period of time. I mean, that's where the questioning comes in. All they are is just. Um, markers, they are imagery, they are just reminders for us on, you know, specific momentos, times in our lives, whatever. But, um, you know, you take that away and then it, it, you know, you kind of strip that information away. I question myself what else is left there um, in terms of, of, of what are my reminders of my own past? Because that again will change over time. Um, they may be forgotten for me. I hope that don't happen. Um, you know, because I'm in control of my own identity in some ways over what I remember or what I assimilate with over time. Um, and and that plays a role in terms of my art making because when when I ask myself that question, if that, if that is stripped away and someone's looking at my work. Um, how much of a role is it for me to to break that stereotype of what people expect to see? Because if you are of a certain color, if you are making a certain kind of work, obviously they have their presumption there. But um, I question myself again. It's like most of the time I feel, yes, it is my role to explain about my work. How far do I push that line of educating someone in the big perspective of, of worldviews is what you were highlighting on. Uh, you know, and it's different all the time. I'm in that situation a lot as well, and I'm sure some of you are, you know, and ties in again as, as someone, as a creator, basically. And, and, you know, we have the power to make that difference in that, that minute on and explaining. But when it comes to artwork, I think there's definitely that evolution over time, over narratives, over objects, over what, what we create. So. Wow. Does anyone have any final thoughts? I would say just be true to yourself. It sounds cheesy, but you know, if you're feeling it, do it and then put it out there and see, see who's responding. Like, you know, what, who's really upset at you? Uh -huh. Question, question that, you know, like who owns this, who owns this imagery, who owns this, this culture, who, you know, we need to like start mixing that up. We need to think about these things. We need to think about like this kind of hierarchy of ownership. But how important is that in terms of viewership? I question that at yep. least for myself. You know, it's like, do I really care to a certain extent who's someone who's going to come in and, and, and view my work a certain way? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the way I approach making my work. I, I want to share. Like as artists, we have these experiences, we internalize those experiences, and then through our artwork is how we express our feelings about it. So I want to share my feelings, but I don't know that I'm necessarily going to change anyone else's minds about certain things based off my work. And I don't know if is it my responsibility to do that or not? Awesome. Well, I think I'm going to wrap up our conversation. Thank you all so much for your time and your energy and, you know, all of the wonderful, incredible things that, and thoughts that you had to say about your work and making in general. Um, and thanks for being like our first guests on this roundtable series. Um, so, Later in the week, this recording will go up on our website and on our YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to take a look back, they'll be able to do that. Um, thank you, Tanya, Salvador, Leslie, and Heinrich for sharing so much with us. Um, 
keep an eye out on our social media for we're going to do these monthly. So um, in August, our theme is storytelling and craft. Um, so keep an eye out on our social media for dates and times for that and for the panelists that will be selected for that. Um, but we hope that you'll join us again in the series. And on behalf of everyone here at Aramont, stay safe and stay creative. Um, thanks, y'all. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it.